Well, good morning, everyone. As you can tell, we are passionate about Passion Week and the exciting events coming up this coming week. And I do think that passion is in the air. I know that I'm walking just a little bit taller this morning because my son Spencer and his beautiful girlfriend Justice were engaged this weekend. Stand up, both of you, so everyone, so I can show you off. And Justice Brothers are here as well, Isaiah and Devin from Texas, and Devin lives in L.A. Can we give them a hand as well? So this is an exciting weekend. Of course, uh, today is typically known as Palm Sunday, and we're going to be talking a little bit about that today. But before we do, I have the extraordinary privilege of presenting to you several new members here at Higher Vision Church. If you are a new member, would you please stand up and come down to the front very quickly? I just, I want to present you to our congregation. This is incredible. Isn't this awesome? This shows you how Higher Vision Church is growing. And, you know, here at Higher Vision, membership is about believing and about belonging. It's about believing in Christ and belonging to a church family. And these individuals have made that declaration, we believe in Christ, we want to belong to Higher Vision Church. And so we're blessed today to have all of you here today. Thank you so much for going through our membership class and for being a part of, of Higher Vision Church. Can we pray over them? Let's do that right now. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for all of our new members. Your word declares, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies, maketh increase of the body unto the edification of itself in love. I thank you that more and more people are making increase of the body. They're lending their talents, their time, their gifts, their abilities to make this community of faith an influential voice in this Santa Clarita Valley across the U.S. and around the world. So we bless them today in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. amen. Thank you so much today. Well, grab your source for Scripture today. Turn with me to Romans chapter 5. You know, typically on Palm Sunday, we will hear a message concerning the triumphant entry, where Jesus enters Jerusalem, the people are going crazy, they're shouting out and declaring, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And there's this celebratory message that's often preached on, Palm, preached on Palm Sunday concerning just the exaltation of Jesus. Well, today I want to talk about the other side of Palm Sunday. It's the side that we recognize when we understand that when Jesus was entering into Jerusalem to the cheers of the multitude, that he was getting ready to face the darkest night of his soul. He was getting ready to experience just a horrible week, sorrow, suffering, pain. Of course, he's confronted by the cross. And in the midst of all that is taking place during the Passion Week, Christ finds strength in the midst of his struggle. And that's the title of the message today, Finding Strength in the Struggle. Would you say that after me, Finding Strength in the Struggle? So let's look at Romans chapter 5, beginning at verse 3, and let's read this together, if you will, everyone together. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, 
I just simply want to pray the prayer that my daughter Grace prayed a few years ago when she prayed. Lord, help us to go through what we need to go through and help us to go through what we've never gone through. So, Heavenly Father, I ask you in the midst of the message today to strengthen us, to build us up. May this become a transformational moment, a bedrock of faith moment in our lives as we find strength in the struggle. In your Son's name, amen. Most of us know today that we, we go through ups and downs. Some of us are going through some good times right now. Some of us are going through some difficult times. But here's the idea that I, I want you to recognize, and that is no matter what, there will be bumps in the road. There will be some mountains in your way. There will be some problems with no easy solutions. I like to talk about the struggle family showing up at the front door. Hey, honey, the struggles are here. You know, they just kind of show up unexpectedly. And all of a sudden, you're facing relational struggles with the people you love. Or you're facing financial struggles. Things should be working out in that particular area, but for some reason, the financial uh, opportunities are not there, and, and you find yourself facing some problematic times. Or the spiritual tr struggles show up, and you feel distance from God. There's just something that isn't quite right in your relationship with God. Even those of us today who are new Christians, newcomers in Christ, sometimes we'll experience some struggles. We will commit our lives to Christ, invite Christ into our lives and feel like, okay, everything's going to work out, everything's going to be fine, only to realize that tribulations will also come when we make a commitment to Christ. Maybe we lose a job. Maybe we, maybe we lose a family member. And the struggle family begins to say, hey, I, I thought this was a good decision that you were making to follow Christ. It seems so unfair. Now that you've made the decision, things aren't working out like you expected or anticipated. So we all face struggles. But let me give you some encouraging words, especially those of you who are discouraged about being discouraged. There are incredible people in Scripture, like the psalmist David, who was constantly talking about his struggles. You read the Psalms, and you hear him saying words like, my life stinks right now. How come the people I don't like are doing the things that I don't like, and nothing seems to be going wrong in their lives, and yet for me, I'm trying to stand up for you, Christ, I'm trying to live my life for you, and and yet things seem to be falling apart. God, when are you going to take time out of your busy schedule and just wipe everybody off the face of the planet? <laughs> your loving servant, David. And it's an example of, of what takes place, that we're all facing struggles. And yet Jesus said, in the world, you will have tribulations. You will have problems, you will have struggles, but be of good cheer, Jesus said, I have overcome the world. Let's do some exegesis. Let's look at this particular passage, Romans chapter three, or chapter five, beginning at verse three. The first part of this, and we're looking at it now in the New Living Translation, we read it in the New King James just a few minutes ago. When, when the King James said that we could glory in our tribulations. But here's this particular version. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. Now, let's just stop right there because I think sometimes, at least for myself, I wonder how is it possible to rejoice when we slam into problems and trials? That's difficult. In fact, I want to give you an introductory challenge, even before we get to the, the meat of the message, and here it is right now. Just write this down in your notes. Here's the introductory challenge. To rejoice is a choice. Would you say it with me? To rejoice is a choice. Now, how do we, how do, we do that? How do we rejoice? Or in the 
King James Version, we read the idea that the word glory is actually about boasting in God. We glory or boast with extreme confidence when we're going through the midst of a tribulation or a problem or a struggle. How is that possible? Because it's, it's a matter of perspective. If we look at the verse again, verse 3, notice what it says. We can rejoice when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us. For they know that they, we know that they help us develop endurance. I think here's the reason why some of us have a difficult time rejoicing in the midst of struggle, because it's easier to play the blame game with God than to boast in God. I, I know our, our television screens are filled with it. We hear it on the television. We, we hear prophets of doom and gloom talking about it, that God seems to always be the one who's at fault. You know, God seems to be the one who is unfair. I was watching an episode of Chicago Fire last season, and during one of the episodes, this helicopter crashes in the midst of this residential area, and this propeller from the helicopter lands on this poor woman, and one of the firemen says, it was like the hand of God. Place that propeller, just drop that propeller right down on that woman. And when I was watching that, it was like I wanted to jump off my chair and say, no, God's not the one dropping propellers on people. <laughs> it's not God's fault. You know, when, when you're a Christian, it's easy to just say, well, it's God's will. When you're a non-Christian or a pre-Christian, it's easy just to say, well, it's God's fault. So if we lose our job, I've heard people say, you know, I lost my job, it must be God's will. Or it must be God's fault. And I, I'm thinking, no, you don't understand the Bible. Was God the one who fired you? Is it God's fault that you lost your job? Someone talks about, well, someone came and repossessed my car this week. It must have been God's will. Or God's fault, and I'm saying, no. Do you not understand that God wasn't the one who didn't pay the bill or make the payments? God didn't say, collectors, go get that car. As if it was God's fault. Or we, we can even look at some other examples, like, and this is more of a tragic example, where little Johnny gets hit by a drunk driver, and it's God's will, or it's God's fault. And I'm thinking, what are we saying? God wasn't the one who was driving the car. God wasn't the one who was intoxicated here. God wasn't the one who, who hurt that little child. God, it wasn't God's fault, or perhaps you've heard this example. You know, a tsunami hits a nation or a country, and it's God's fault, or it's God's will that thousands of people were killed, and I'm going, no, what, what are we, we saying here? Have, have we not read the scripture that talks about that God is not willing that anyone should perish, but that all should come to repentance, that every soul is important to God, and we think that God's going to send a tsunami to destroy thousands of people's lives in another country or, or another nation? That's not what I read in Scripture. I read Scriptures like, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. I, I read Scriptures like the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. But Jesus said, I am come to give life and to give it more abundantly. Yeah, I read scriptures like, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. That's what I read in scripture. 
In fact, this message that I'm preaching this morning must be a bedrock message in your spiritual journey. I, this needs to be one of those messages that, that you take lots and lots of notes, you take it home, you activate it in your life, and it becomes a building block for you because you're answering the question, why do bad things happen to good people? This isn't even in your notes, but I'm going to give you three reasons right now. Take these down. Bedrock foundational steps for your spiritual faith. Number one, we find strength in the struggle and we rejoice. We choose to rejoice. Rejo to rejoice is a choice. It's a perspective. But bad things happen to good people because number one, there's a bad enemy. There's an enemy who's trying to wreck people's lives and destroy people's family, number one. Number two, decisions that we make have consequences. Every time we're making decisions, we're impacting people's lives. That's not God, that's us. Come on, somebody. I, I hope you're getting that this morning. So if we break the law, if, if we drink and drive, if we do something that impacts others, it's not God, it's the consequences of our decisions. And number three, can I just be simple and say life is filled with accidents. I'm telling you, when I get up at night and I stub my toe on the end of the bed, that's not God's fault. That's life. Life is full of accidents. We're, we're going to stub our toes. If, if my son Spencer, when he was little, was walking beside me and fell down, just a little guy at that time. Now he's taller than I am. I don't know. But just a little guy. And he stubs his toe or he falls down and he, and he scrapes up his knees because I'm his dad. Is it my fault? It's life. He fell down. Do you understand that all of us are living life, our lives, and we're going to make mistakes, and we're going to fall down, and we're going to experience some things in life? Is it God's fault as our heavenly Father that we stubbed our toe? Is it God's fault that we fell down and hurt ourselves? No. When, when my son would, would hurt himself, I would reach down, and I would hold him until he stopped crying, and I would love on him as his father. When we fall down and make mistakes, God reaches down, and he picks us up, and he... He holds us. He declares, I'm here. I'm walking with you through the midst of your trial, through the midst of your circumstance. Through the midst of your struggle, you can find strength in the struggle, not because of the struggle, but because you're not blaming me, you're boasting in me. You understand how good I am, how, how great I am, how awesome and, and mighty I am. You understand I'm walking with you through the midst of your struggle and your pain and your sorrow and your suffering. I'm here in the midst of it. Well, I, I think we could just close our Bibles right now and go home. That's a pretty good message. <laughs> Do we need to hear any more? I mean, that's a, that's a foundational message that will completely transform our paradigm. But let's unpack it just a little bit more. Let's go back to verse 3. It tells us, For we know that they, problems and struggles, help us develop endurance. Notice those two words, develop endurance. Endurance, first major idea, write this down. Our struggle strengthens our endurance. Come on, say it with me. Our struggle strengthens endurance. Now let's just exegete this a bit. Our struggle, interesting word. It's the Greek word thlipsis. I love to say that word, thlipsis, okay? It's, it's a Greek word, but here's what it means, and I think you can relate to it. I know I can it means to, to crush or to hem us in or make us small. You feel like 
That's what your struggle tries to do. It, it tries to hem you in so you, you feel like you're, you're small, you're crushed. But that's not the purpose of what God wants to do in the midst of your struggle. God was, doesn't want you to be, feel like you're made small. He wants to produce something in you out of that struggle. In fact, the next word, our, our struggle strengthens, or actually it, it's the word produce. It's an agricultural term which, which talks about God is working below the surface of our lives, and he's digging deep in the soil of our lives to produce something in us that we, we're not even able to see yet. He's cultivating the earth. He's cultivating the ground. He's, he's working something out below the surface because what's getting ready to come out of that is not going to make us small, but it's going to make us big. It's, it's not going to hem us in, but it's going to cause us to develop endurance. It's, it's an incredible idea. It, it's the idea that God's producing potential. I like to say it this way. My pain is producing potential. My problem is not making me small. It's producing potential. When I decided to uh, run a marathon, a half marathon, let me say, 13.1 <laughs> miles, I can tell you I didn't go out on day one and run 13 miles. I started by running two or three miles, begin to work my way up where I was running 13 miles in a week, not on the same day. Then I started running more and more until near the end of the training process, I was running 25, 30 35 miles during a given week, right? Not running 13 on one day, but in a week. And some days, especially at the end of the training, I was running 9 or 10 miles on that given day. I never did run 13 miles when I was training. I, I waited until the day of the race to run 13 miles. But during the week, listen, my pain was producing my potential. I was strengthening my endurance. The, the problem wasn't making me smaller. It was developing my endurance. I, I know somebody can relate to this word today. That that's what begins to happen with your struggle. Your struggle can make you small or it can strengthen your endurance. An incredible verse of Scripture is found in Proverbs chapter 24. As we read verse 16, it talks about that a righteous person may fall seven times and rise again. And it's interesting, those, those two ideas or that word there, rises again. Because here's the thing, you will want to quit in the struggle, quit in the dip, that's the time you want to give up because your emotions are running like crazy, you're tired, you want to give up, it's in the dip. That's when you go find a cave, an isolated place, and you listen to a lot of country music. <laughs> because just about every song is talking about losing your husband or your wife or your truck or your dog. I mean, think about it. In fact, I laugh and I tell people, listen, if you want to get something back, listen to country music backward, and maybe you'll get the, the, the truck or the dog back, right? No. But it's in the dip that we experience the struggle and, and we want to give up. That, that's the time that we want to give up, but the Scripture says if we're doing the right things, what does righteousness mean? It's talking about doing the right things at the right time. It's talking about following God's ways. Even righteous people will fall down and struggle, but they'll rise again. Now, here's the incredible idea of that, that phrase, that our 
struggle strengthens our endurance. The, the word endurance talks about this, to bear up under difficult circumstances. So here's, I want you to get the, the visual. And I, I love the second part, which says you're standing behind God. But here's what your struggle can do for you. It, it can produce endurance where you're, you're bearing up. You're standing up. You're, you're bearing up under the problem, under the struggle. And you know you're going to get through it because you're standing behind your expectation of God. That really the question is not what I can do to get through it. You're just bearing up under it. The real question is, who is going to get me through it? So I stop blaming God and I start boasting in God. <laughs> because of my expectation that's already in God. When, when Jesus went through the Passion Week after Palm Sunday... God did not take him out of the struggle. I know, I know, some of us, that's what we pray, right? God, get us out of this mess, take us out of the struggle. God did not take Jesus out of the struggle. He took him through it. Most of the time, God does not take us out. <laughs> he takes us through. Hey, he takes us through it. And when we understand that, it, it produces endurance. Let, let's keep going. Second idea. Next verse. Verse 4. And endurance develops strength of character. So the second idea now is that our endurance strengthens character. What is character? It's who we are. It's getting the who before the do. It's who we are is more important than what we do. It's understanding that if we're working more on the person in private, we don't have to worry about the person in public. That one was good. You need to write that one down. It's not about working on the person in public. It's about working on the person in private. If we're doing that, we don't have to worry about the person in public. Come on, somebody. Character. And our endurance strengthens character. Now, I just want to give you a couple of ideas. And here's, you know, you may be thinking, well, how does that happen? How, how does my endurance strengthen character? How is that done? Two ways, right here. Number one, you force your struggle to tell the truth. Because your struggle... He loves to lie. She loves to lie. Constantly, the struggle family will be whispering in your ear a bunch of lies. When I was going through a season in my own life of, of depression, deep depression, here's what the struggle family was saying to me. This is horrible. This is the tip of the iceberg. You're not going to get through it. You're never going to recover. And I had to force my struggle to tell the truth. It started back at the beginning, you know. This is a horrible situation. Yes, that's true. This is horrible. But second of all, this is the tip of the iceberg. No, that's a lie. It's not the tip of the iceberg. Murphy's law is not true. Life is not out to get me. <laughs> I am in Christ. Christ is in me. <laughs> it's a lie. My struggle's trying to lie to me. That it's the tip of the iceberg. That I'm not going to recover. That's a lie from the pit of hell. From the father of lies. I've recovered every other time when I've gone through the midst of a struggle so I know I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to recover this time. He's going to take me through it. I'm forcing my struggle to tell the truth. As Will Smith would say, tell the truth. You tell the truth. I'm forcing it to tell the truth. It's important. Number two, this is how character will be developed in your life. Endurance strengthens character. You force your struggle to allow for mistakes. 
I'm telling you, none of us are perfect. We're all going to make mistakes. Force your struggle. I, I've talked to people who have told me, but I, I've made too many st- mistakes in the past. Ten years ago, I made this decision and it impacted my life. I went down this wrong path for a career choice, or I married the wrong person, or I made this choice, and now I'm suffering. I, all I can expect is second best. And I thought, where do you read in the Bible that you only get God's second best? Where do you read that? Moses was a murderer. Moses, before he ever delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt, he murdered an Egyptian. Can you imagine Moses saying, you know, I got to settle for second best. I can't lead the children of Israel out of Egypt because I I killed a man, I murdered a man in my past, so God can't use me anymore. How about David who committed adultery, and yet God used him as a king? How about Samson who broke the Nazarite vow, and yet he stood up on an appointed day and, and brought judgment upon the people who were trying to destroy God's people. God used him mightily. He didn't get second best. He got what God had planned and prepared for him. Not talking about the fact that we don't experience consequences, but hear this very clearly. God's will is fluid. It's not static. Oh, I feel like my spirit man's just getting ready to jump out of my chest. Condemnation right now. I'm just breaking free from some of you right now who felt like your past would destroy your present and future. No, 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 no. God's will is fluid. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, who who love him and are called according to his purpose. Your endurance is strengthening your character. It's incredible. Look at the next verse. Your character now begins to strengthen your hope. Let's read read that next verse. And character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And notice, it's not just talking about daily hope, but our hope of salvation to come, everlasting hope. Everlasting hope. Here's the exciting news for us. What we're going through today doesn't even compare (laughs) to what we're going to experience with the greatness of God in the future. That's what Romans 8 says. It's what it declares to us. It says to us that the afflictions that we're experiencing right now, Romans 8, don't even compare to the glory that God will give to us later. I'm just passing through. I Maybe... I'm not pointing a finger at anyone. I'm pointing a finger at myself just to say sometimes I get so intoxicated with this world that I forget I'm just a suitcase traveling from one destination to the next. (laughs) That I don't have to be worried about the next number associated with the next birthday. That this life is a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanisheth away. That I'm just traveling through. I I was reading this uh, example of a pastor who went to visit this young man who was going through surgery after surgery, always in pain. And so the pastor shows up at the hospital room and, and he asked the young guy, are you doing okay Do you feel like God's being unfair here? And again, I just want to scream. No! You're you're continuing to perpetuate this whole idea that it's God's fault, that that he's going surgery after surgery. But I love love the young man's answer, and this is what he says. He says, no, not at all. This is the way I see it. 
that God is going to spend eternity making it up to me. Woo! Man, when we have that understanding that this moment of affliction is but a flicker of light, but God's glory will be revealed to us in a measure that we can't even understand. Something changes in our spiritual paradigm. Something reverses in our, in our lives. I'm telling you, all morning I was walking around singing, Jesus getting us ready for that great day. Jesus getting us ready for that great day. Jesus getting us ready for that great, great day. We shall be able to stand. Jesus getting us ready for that great day. Jesus getting us ready for that great, great day. Jesus getting us ready for that great day. We shall be able to stand. All the saints adore him on that great day. All the saints adore him on that great, great day. All the saints adore him on that great day. We shall be able to stand. Because we have a hope. Now notice the last part, and we're just going to wrap it up with this last idea. Here's what hope produces. Struggle strengthens our endurance. Our endurance strengthens our character. Our character strengthens our hope. And our hope strengthens God's love. This hope will not lead to disappointment. For we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. Which, by the way, who's doing the filling? I, I'm not doing the filling. When I need a dose of God's love, I can't do that. I can't just manufacture that kind of love in my heart. I have to rely upon the Holy Spirit to pour out a little bit more love when I need it to love people who seem unlovely. <laughs> because I, I can't do that. Only the Holy Spirit living on the inside of me can, can do that. So let me encourage you today, when you, you need some more of God's love, don't try to conjure it up yourself. Don't try to manufacture it. Just say, Holy Spirit, I need you. Just dose me with your love. I need a dose of the ghost. I, I need <laughs> Holy Ghost, I just need a little bit more of you. I need your, I need your love in my life. And what I'm getting ready to say, if, if you'll grasp this today, will literally transform your, your spiritual paradigm. You'll walk out of here with a, with a brand new understanding. This is a bedrock message. It's a foundational message for every Christian. And here it is. In the morning... Don't get up and blame God. Get up and acknowledge that God loves you and has a plan for your life. Hallelujah. When you get up, I'm, I'm telling you, this, this, this will shake your spirit to the core. It, it, will, it will change everything in your life. If you'll just... Get up. I'm talking about finding strength in the struggle. If you'll just get up, don't blame God, but just acknowledge how much God loves you and how much he has a plan for your life. Because as that song says, he is a good, good father. That's who he is. That's who he is. And I'm loved by him. 
That's who I am. That's what I'm acknowledging today. That's, that's who I am. If we go full circle to Palm Sunday and we see Jesus coming into Jerusalem to all the cheers, Hosanna to the Son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I believe what Jesus was thinking about was this week, I'm loved by my Father. I'm going to make it through the struggle because I'm loved by Him. He's going to help me through it. My struggle will strengthen my endurance. My endurance will strengthen my character. My character will strengthen my hope. And my hope will strengthen God's love in my life. How do we know that's what took place? Because when Jesus was suspended between heaven and earth on the cross, he was able to speak these words in the midst of the darkest night of the soul. Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. Jesus couldn't say that if he hadn't found strength in the midst of the struggle. If he hadn't allowed that process to take place in his life. And that's what I'm, I'm telling you today. Hear me and hear me well. Hatred won't cover a multitude of sin. Only love will. 